What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Please make sure to like and to share the videos. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button. And as we do before we get started with any endeavor on this channel, uh, I give a shout out to all of my members. I want to give a shout out to the people who help support the channel and to keep it going. I want to give a shout out to Nicola Zlobin. I want to give a shout out to Issa Abdul Zahir, Kellen Jakala, Leroy Honeycutt, Sherrod Martin, Ricky Dawson, Brother Love, Black Dog, NEU, Cedric Bowman, True 7360, BK Born Shaheed, James Washington, Hostile Adept, Seven Coast Dojo, Ronan Martin, Shop Talk Live, WPR One, Roguish the Billmonger, I Care, The Nameless Protagonist, Force Windu, Lady Miss Thing Green, BGS Ibmore, and Marvin Battle Jr. So having got that out of the way, what's good, people in the uh, chat? I want to give a shout out to Pingly Me Jingly. <laughs> That's an odd choice of names, but you know, hey, if you like it, I love it. Uh, Peace out to Brian Tolbert saying, dog, I, I feel you over there in the U, uh, UAE. What's up, dog? Team Art Neustel TV. What's good with you, bro? And uh, Ty Dan TV UK channel and NJ Progressive Indie. What's good, brothers? So, <laughs> you know, it's odd that I would uh, name the stream when black male academicians had balls. But, you know, the only thing I, I wanted to illustrate is that as it relates to protecting the image and the integrity of black males, there have always been black men at the vanguard. And they have been making an attempt since the outset to protect the imagery and the iconography of black men. And we, you know, we, we often have these discussions about black feminism and the ways in which black feminism has come along and has in some sense tarnished the imagery, the iconography, uh, the integrity of black men and their reputations. And so I wanna give a shout out to Dr. Robert E. Staples. Now, I don't know if you know who Dr. Robert Staples is, but Dr. Robert Staples, for the most part, passed uh, this year. Okay. He died at the age of 79. And he died on February the 7th. And he was, for the most part, a towering figure in the field of black family life. I mean, for the most part, he worked in the sociology department and the behavioral sciences department at the University of California in San Francisco. And he was first appointed to this position in 1973. But prior to that appointment, he was a faculty member at Howard University, Fisk University, and California State University at Hayward, and Dr. Stables, uh, for the most part, concurrently served as a visiting professor at a number of institutions, including Tougaloo College, Florida State University, the University of Michigan, the University of Hawaii, Cornell University, the Institute of Family Studies in Melbourne, Australia, and the University of Warwick, Coventry, England. So Dr. Staples earned his master's degree in sociology from San Jose State University and his doctorate in family sociology from the University of Minnesota. Now this man is prolific. He's published over 200 articles in scholarly publications in countries around the world and has written and edited an extensive list of books on black families, many of which have been adopted as standard texts in more than 500 colleges and universities in the United States, Africa, the West Indies, and England. Among his books are Black Masculinity, which was published in 1982, the Urban Plantation, which was published in 1987, 
The Black Family, Essays and Studies, 1991, and Black Families at the Crossroads in 1993. So when Dr. Robert Staples speaks, I think it's important for us to listen. Thank you, Man Friday, for the contribution. I'll see you in the house, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for attending. And happy birthday, my brother. What's good with you, Doc? Happy birthday. Hey, look. Doctor still putting in work, man. But uh, you know, Dr. Johnson has, you know, turned another leaf. You know, he's uh a little bit older today. So I want you all to wish Dr. Johnson a happy birthday. Uh again, thank you, man, Friday, for the contribution. But what I'd like to do for you all is to see or to come into contact with one of his pieces of writing and the title of that uh that writing is the myth of the black macho a response to angry black feminists <laughs> now I, you know we we often uh you know we we have a lot to say about feminism but here's a man who is well researched well published uh, exonerated and honored uh, in in the, the academy. So I just want to examine what he has to say at a time in which the black macho came out. And we all know that, that this book has had an impact on the imagery of black man throughout the United States and, and more than likely throughout the world. So I think we, when we look at it, we should also be, you know, mindful of the timeliness in which he he wrote it. Uh, you know, we we have a lot more tools at our disposal and a lot more research at our disposal when we we look at responses to black feminism. But I think his is just as good as any. So what I want to do is just dig right into it. And you know, sometimes I read from text, and I think this text is a valuable uh, one to to take a look at. And I, I want to give a shout out uh, to. Sir Tice he says, thank you for doing this, Dr. GG. When I lived in uh, Minnesota, one of the OGs told me about him. Thanks for featuring this, brother. Happy birthday also to Professor T, for sure, for sure. So let's just, let's just get right into it, okay? So I'm gonna share the screen and I'm gonna get right into this, right? So this article was written in 1979. Uh, eight years after I was born, and it was published in uh, a journal called The Black Scholar, which is still in print, and one of the flagship uh, journals where black research and scholarship is done. So for the most part, it's a, a, a great article. It's a great contribution, and I just want to dig into what he has to say. So Let's just get into it. So he says, and this is in 79 now, just be mindful. He says, the modern women's movement is barely 10 years old. In that decade, it was largely populated by middle-class white women who focused on symbolic and class-bound issues, such as protesting women as sex objects in magazines and attempts to put more women into corporate boardrooms and other male domains. By and large, black women were not present in large numbers in the mainstream women's movement, a conspicuous absence since many white women took them, meaning black women, as their model of strong, independent woman. And black women, such as Eileen Hernandez, Flo Kennedy, and others, were leading spokesmen for women's issues. It was said that black women were already liberated, that white women were as racist as white men and the middle class issues on which the movement focused were irrelevant to the largely working class black population. Moreover, the black male had been spared as target, as a target of feminists. After all, he certainly was in no position to be sexist, whether he wanted to be or not. White feminists generally left him alone in their assault on men. Many were careful to refer to white male domination as their main gripe. 
In the last few years, however, a few of them have taken off the gloves. Black males can now be attacked, not as the banker denying white women credit, but as the sadistic rapist lurking in the alley to terrorize and sodomize a white woman to whom he has no other access. Never mind that it was mostly black women who were being raped while it was white women screaming rape. Woo-wee. Wow. It was almost a throwback to the 50s when the worst crime possible was the violation of a white woman's body by a big dick nigger. To rape black women is not nice. To sexually assault a white woman is an abomination and a sign of not knowing one's place or so read in the works of Susan Brown Miller and Diana Russell. In this era of racist retrenchment, it would not do for white women to come down too hard on black men. More naive souls might suspect them of racism in collaboration with the white male's attack on minorities, a la Alan Baki. After all, white women had meticulously set themselves apart from white men only a few years ago when they were labeled minorities and placed into the affirmative action pool with Blacks, Asians, Latinos, and Native Americans. Some have called this cynical manipulation of the symbols of minority status. At best, it served to diffuse the movement of other minorities and decrease their chances at upward mobility. Man, there's a lot packed into that first page. I mean, this guy is basically saying, at first, black men were left off of the they were left off of the grid. They were not under the main purview of the women's movement. But then all of a sudden, the gloves came off. It was okay to malign the character of black men and to place them in the pool of men that needed to be denigrated related to that movement. And it had to do with rape. Now, of course, black women being in the position that they are in this society, after all, they are black. So it's a injustice, but not an abomination. The main focal point of rape related to black men has always been that fear of the big dick black man coming in to do something egregious, evil to the pure white woman. So, but then all of a sudden, white women find a way to juxtapose themselves as minorities, which is quite odd given that white women had always maintained some kind or some semblance of privilege in United States culture. So it's quite puzzling as he says. Some people see this, right, as a manipulation of the symbols of minority status. And it seemed to diffuse the movement of other minorities and decrease their chances at upward mobility. So he's saying this in 79. Already he's understanding that there's something amiss, something foul that's going on. I want to thank you, T Fitness, for you for the donation. I appreciate it, brother. I really do. So digging back into the article, he goes on to say, since white feminists could not marshal an all-out attack on black males because it would seem to be something racist, right? So since white feminists could not marshal an all-out attack on black males, and well-known black female activists such as Joyce Laidner and Angela Davis would not, how could they be put in their place? So enter Nozaki Shange and Michelle Wallace. So while other black writers have trouble finding a forum to discuss the persistence of racist conditions, Miss Shange's play for colored girls who have considered suicide is on Broadway and road shows have drawn sellout audiences throughout the United States, composed mostly of black women and whites. Reports that a black male is offered as a sacrificial lamb at the end of her play are greatly over-exaggerated. Michelle Wallace's new book, Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman, has been heralded 
as one uh, as the most publicized book on blacks since Roots. She can be found on the cover of Miss Magazine and in the pages of the New York Times. While the personal background of an author is no defensible basis for judging their work, I find it difficult to overlook in the case of these two women. And then he goes on to talk about the background. He says, both came from very middle-class backgrounds, had some involvement with street brothers, and are now urging black women to go it alone. They may not be all that is, uh, that may not be all that is important about them. It is all I know. And I recognize that both women are angry. It is important that we understand why. Is it because all of the gains, the black movement have gone to men? Certainly this does not appear to be the case in the year 1979. Because of their double minority status, black women have made unprecedented educational and economic gains in the last couple of years. Now he's talking about 1979. Then he cites uh, some statistics. There are over 84,000 more black women enrolled in college than black men. In a recent survey of 25,000 black women, Essence Magazine reported, then, uh, excuse me, reported that more than a third of them earned 200,000, um, excuse me, 20,000 or more a year. So I don't know exactly what that would equate to in today's dollars, but I, I suspect that it has it probably would be the equivalent of something like sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars now. Okay, that, that's just my guess. And then he says, "Well, it's indeed puzzling why this attack on black men is occurring when black women threaten to overtake them in terms of education, occupation, and income by the next century." And we are here, my friends. We're here in the next century. And he says, "True." Lower class black women are not faring well, but lower class black men are in an even worse condition. Remember too that Ms. Shange and Ms. Wallace are middle class and that undoubtedly is their frame of reference. Perhaps we can find the answer in another set of statistics. There are 188 college educated black women to every 100 similar black males. The interracial marriage rate increased by one third in the 70s and 54% of all adult black women are never married, separated, widowed, or divorced. Ms. Wallace, for instance, does not attempt to disguise her anger at black men, but this is a personal quarrel which I frankly would be reluctant to air in its most naked form. There are, as always, two sides to the story, which is an ugly one at that. Ms. Wallace gives us the female side, and I confess to being troubled at what I hear. Now, before dealing with Ms. Wallace, let us examine Ms. Shange's play and the reaction to it. It might be necessary to clarify on the personal level that I found little in the Shange or Wallace work that related to my personal experience. Most likely, that is due to my Southern origin and present middle-class environment. The two of them write of the urban, Northern, lower-class Black woman and her experiences. Yet, there is nothing they write which indicates that this is not the universal black experience. So in other words, they're writing about a particular class of persons in a specific geographical location, and they're extrapolating from that particular demographic and that particular geographical location to the multitude of black men and black women who have had experiences with black men. So then he goes on to say, yet there is nothing they write which indicates that this is not the universal black experience. Most blacks may know that. Their large, uh, largely white audience does not. In Ms. Shange's play, we witness the abuse of black women by black men, to waiting for men who do not show, to the horror of watching him drop her baby out of a window. At the end of her play, black women are exhorted to love themselves because presumably, Nobody else does or will. The play is drawn from the real life experiences of some black women. How many? I don't know. There are a million stories in the black community and one may choose to tell only a few of them. Ms. Shange does not care to tell us the story of why so many black men feel their manhood, more accurately, their feeling of self-respect is threatened by black women. We are never told that many of these men are acting out because of all groups in this society, 
They have no basis for any sense of self-actualization or somebodiness. There is a curious rage festering inside black men, like it or not. They have not been allowed to fulfill the roles, that is breadwinner, protector, society ascribes to them. While it is considered sexist to say so, the fact remains that many black women do get a sense of fulfillment from bearing and raising children. Some black men have nothing but their penis, an object which they use on as many women as possible. In their middle years, they are deprived of even that mastery of the symbols of manhood as the sex drives wanes and the consuming chase of women becomes debilitating. What is curious is the reaction of black women to this play. Watching a performance, one sees a collective appetite for black male blood. The reaction, however, is not unanimous as many women are greatly disturbed by the play and its vicious assault on black men. Particularly upset are the happily married women who have no pent up frustration which need a release. At the end of the play, what I especially find unsettling is Sean Gay's invitation to black women to love themselves. This seems to me to be no less than an extension of the culture of narcissism. She does not mention compassion for misguided black men or a love of child, family, and community. It all seems so strange, exhorting black women to go it alone. They, many of them, are already alone. That is their main complaint. Black men have deserted them. A black woman who loves only herself is incapable of loving others. What greater way to ensure being alone the rest of your life than the self-centered posture so eloquently expressed in Nozaki Shange's play. This is not to deny the existence or its prevalence of black male narcissism, only to question how adding the black women's to it or the women's to it will help our cause in. So there's a lot going on there. Many black women at that time were complaining that, where are all the good black men? Where are they? They're not present. And so her response is, to tell the tales of the terrible experiences of a few hand-picked black women, and then from there to promote to women the ideal that they ought to go it alone because these black men are horrible. So he's questioning that. He's taking pause with it. He's taking issue with it. He has umbrage with it, right? And then he goes on to say, what obscures the issue at hand here is the lack of a reasonable and articulate male point of view. Those things that bother black men, feelings of nobodiness, fear of vulnerability are often not talked about. What is articulated comes out sounding like insensitive male chauvinism, accusing black women of being domineering, sexually hung up and the like. Little wonder that workshops on black male, female relationships degenerate into shouting matches. On the other hand, black women have learned to link their grievances to the feminist cause. Now that is a very important point. Black women have learned to link their grievances to the feminist cause. Now the question is, why is that happening? And then he goes on to say, Michelle Wallace, for example, seems to be the angriest at black men who date and marry white women and the poverty of black women. Whether one is for or against misogynation, and misogynation is interracial relationship having or copulation amongst people from different races. So he says, whether one is for or against misogynation, and he says, I'm indifferent, it would appear to be a matter of personal choice. Certainly, it seems a strange choice of subject to link to the feminist cause. As the poverty of black women is concerned, there is little that black men have to do with that and even less that they can do to improve her economic condition. Of course, we can agree that men should help to support even raise children that they sire within the extent of their ability to do so. Again, that is a matter between a husband and a wife or the courts as a last resort. It does not seem to be a strong issue among white feminists. When Ms. Wallace talks about black men denying women meaningful positions in civil rights organizations, she is on sounder ground. 
So it's like, okay, well, maybe she has a point here. She would also have been a more objective writer had she placed this issue in historical context. During the 60s, there was a general consensus among men and women that black men would hold the leadership positions in the movement. The reasoning behind this philosophy was that black women had held up their men for too long and it was time for men to take charge. That some black men used the movement to advance the cause of men only cannot be denied. Again, the rationale was the trickle down theory that by enabling black men to advance, the entire black family would be uplifted. Miss Wallace has a point when she claims that some black men's vision of freedom only included a white woman in every bed and a black woman under every heel. Would that we had known. Yet, corrupt leadership is not peculiar to blacks. The betrayal of a movement's ideals is replete in the annals of human history or humanity. To her credit, she acknowledges that the majority of black men pursued a more decent and humane existence for all black people. Understand me, I have no disagreement with much of Wallace's argument. If we choose to view roles and behavior linked to gender that were traditional and normative 10 years ago as sexist, then we all stand guilty of retroactive male chauvinism. The fact that male behavior was normative behavior until recently defined as sexism poses some theoretical problems for feminists. Unlike many, or excuse me, unlike other minorities who suffered physically at the hands of their oppressor, women were generally a protected group that was revered by men and children alike. Obviously, they were limited in their intellectual and creative expression, but society operated on a pre pro quo basis. If you want to dance to the music, you have to pay the band. Then he goes on to talk about men. Many men never liked the idea of having to work to support a family either. Yet society never held out any other option for them nor any exemption for fighting America's wars or doing this dirty work. Black women, of course, did not share in the privileges of white women, and neither did black men partake of the dominant power of white men. The issue here is that what is often defined as sexist behavior is nothing more than men acting in ways which they have been socialized to behave. That they continue to act this way in the face of warnings from feminists signals that lifelong socialization is not easily reversed. Many women cater to and prefer traditional male behavior, and no group gives up its privileges without a prolonged struggle. That's important there, because even though women will complain about black men being toxically masculine and so on and so forth, it is the case that many women cater to and prefer traditional male behavior. And a lot of what they complain about is that men aren't able to or not displaying traditional male behavior. But due that there's a shifting circumstance or set of circumstances socially, it's quite odd that at the same time, black men are required to change their behavior and alter their comportment in such a way as to fit into the feminist ideal of what men should be acting like but then at the same time be able to display these traditional roles to the benefit of women, it leaves men in a confused state of mind, not knowing what to do, not knowing whether they should downplay their masculinity or play it up. So this creates this tension, right? Then he goes on to say, still the problem of defining what is sexist behavior among black men is a complicated one. And this is something that Dr. Tia San Johnson has spoken about over and over and over again. On the institutional level, most black men do not have the power to force women into subordinate roles. Most of the institutions in which black people are located are controlled by whites. The most significant exception, the black church has a male leadership and a largely female constituency. One, however, can find it difficult to make a case for black male sexism in the church simply because most black men are not in the church and could care less who is in charge. Man, I've said this again and again and again. Most black men don't go to church, man. 
Most black men are not going to sit there for two to three hours listening to songs being sung, listening to men or, or, or watching men or women shout in ecstatic trance while they pass around a collection plate. Black men are, are not into that, at least not at the present time. If it wasn't the case in 1979, we know it's not the case, not the case now. But I digress. Then he says, and this is something that Dr. Johnson says also, and what men in the manosphere have been saying since its inception, namely that this leaves one other black controlled institution in which sexism can manifest itself, the family. There's considerable, uh, considerable disagreement over how much power black men have in the family since they are almost absent from the family as they are from the church. In intact black families, some black men are absolute patriarchs. When I spoke before a group of married black women recently, it was surprising to hear them talk of the firm control of their lives and actions by their husbands. But on the other hand, many single black women complain about how passive black men are, how they won't take responsibility for making decisions. While watching a Detroit television program the other day, I listened to Dr. Gail Parker talk about how she happened to achieve such a high educational level. All the strong people in her family, she reported, were women. That was her role model, and it never occurred to her that she should subordinate her aspirations for the sake of a man. Both these examples suggest there are two types of black families, ones in which women make the major decisions and those in which men make them. That, incidentally, was the finding of sociologists Blood and Wolf when they compared black and white wives' decision-making powers almost 20 years ago. As the percentage of female-headed households increases, and they may be the majority of all black families by the year 2000, and he ain't lied, man. This man is not lied in relation to this claim <laughs> because for the most part, most of the families are black women uh, uh, managed in the year 2000 and beyond. We're in 2020 now, right? The women will make all the decisions because the men will simply not be there. Black men are not staying with their families or that black men are not staying with their families is due to a confluence of certain factors. Not the least among them is the fact that some women do make the decisions and desertion is his form of masculine protest. While this may be abhorrent to some of us, sexism is a strange label to impose on his behavior. Desertion, moreover, is the lower class male style of exercising his masculine prerequisite. So in other words, a lot of black men are saying, well, if I don't have any input, I can't manage or make a decision in the context of this familial arrangement, then what's the point of me being here? What am I supposed to do, be a concu-surf? What am I supposed to do, be a Simp, a maggle, but that's a whole nother discussion altogether. He says that the middle class black male with a wider range of choices screens out the strong black woman beforehand in his choice of mates. This man reminds me of S Y S B M. Black men have been doing this all along. What's the point for men to be involved in a relationship, for one, where they have no control or input, and then why would they want to deal with the strong black woman type when there are other options? And he's acknowledging this in 1979. So he says, anyone who has met the typical middle-class black wife knows she scores higher on the femininity scale than her unmarried counterpart. Now, I don't even know if that's the case now because it has gotten to the point where the talking points of feminism have permeated the entirety of Western culture and the black community. Then he goes on to say, some middle-class black men turn to white women who fit even better the model of femininity as set forth in this country. This accounts in part 
for the reason that interracial marriages often involve the best and brightest of black men. Black women like to dismiss the interracially involved black male as a classic example of the brainwashed idiot who is seduced by whiteness. Yet we never question how such a large proportion of black men who can lead our organizations, publish our magazines, star in our films, sing our songs, write our books, can be so gullible as to be seduced by nothing more than white skin pigmentation. The answer to the question of why middle class black men date and marry white women is not a simple or monolithic one. Suddenly, since the 60s, it has something to do with increased opportunities to do so. Beyond that factor, we have only speculation. It could be that the most successful black men have values and lifestyles most in tune with white society. That is often why they are successful. Among those values will exist the one that women should be supportive and subordinate. Whether true or not, many black men, including those involved with black women, do not believe black women fit that model very well. As previously stated, I'm personally indifferent to the question of whether black men should date or marry white, a position which often the advocates and opponents of said question assume to place me in the enemy camp. For all the screaming and hollering, race mixing still occurs among less than 5% of the black male population. Now, I don't know exactly what it is now. I just don't know. Many of you in the manosphere might know the answer to this question more accurately than I do. But at the time, that he wrote the article, a small number of black men had swirled, okay? Then he goes on to say prison drugs and homosexuality have done much more to reduce the number of eligible males available to black women. In this fluid period, women will not find it easy to carve out an independent career and lifestyle and maintain a stable relationship with a man. In one study of the characteristics of divorced and married women, the divorced women turned out to be significantly more aggressive and independent than the women who remain married. Women to a large extent are victimized by the fact that the very same characteristics they need to obtain career mobility, aggressive, strong achievement drive, are the ones which make it difficult to attract and hold a man. Thus, they are often placed in the position of a forced, uh, of a forced choice between career and marriage, and men place them in this position by their insistence on women playing supportive, not competitive roles. Then he says, is this sexism? Well, I guess so. It is also a matter of personal choice that cannot be denied men. They have a right to choose a woman that meets their perceived needs, even if their exercise of that right limits the life options of women. In much the same way, women have the right to refuse to enter into a marriage or relationship of any kind that will not permit them freedom of expression. Surely there must be a better way. And some black men and women have found it and live it in a union based on a quasi equalitarian model. There rarely can be a completely equalitarian relationship between any two human beings for so many reasons that it is an impossibility. So that is not really the issue. The issue is what and who determines the various kinds of inequalities that will exist in a male female relationship. And before I go any further, before I go any further, I just want to say, uh, Dr. Johnson is hitting me up and says, I'm sending you pics on charts for intermarriage and Facebook Messenger, uh, black marriage. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute, Doc. But if if I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, add an invite here uh, for for Doc if he wants to come in and chime in on this, because this is something that, you know, I'm not an expert in, but I've, I've toyed around with the, you know, these ideas uh, per my participation in the manosphere. But if, if you feel like you want to drop in and, and comment on this, please do so, Doc. So anyway, uh, I'm going to get back to this article. Okay? And I'm not going to read all of it. I just want to get through some of it. And then we can have a discussion about it. So then he goes on to say, as many of us know, one source of black male female inequalities lies in the shortage of black men, thus limiting the choices and alternatives of black women, as well as exposing them to the abuse of black men, keenly aware of that fact. 
before we decry the abuse of black women and the advantages black men achieve from this situation, it would behoove us to closely examine just how great an advantage it is. First, why is there a black male shortage? At birth, the ratio of men to women is about equal. The answer lies in the higher morbidity and mortality rate in the marriageable years. In the ages 15 through 30, black men have a mortality rate twice that of black women. Even sadder is the fact that homicide and suicide are two of the top three causes of death among them. Now, ultimately what he's saying is, is that black men are dying during their marriageable years. From the ages of 15 to 30, during the time that he wrote the article, the two top causes of black male death were suicide and intraracial homicide, which basically takes a whole host of black men out of the picture. Just takes them out of the picture. So let me uh, pull up my Facebook, because I have the clothes right now, and he's sending me these pics. Facebook Messenger, which I haven't been looking at. So I'm gonna pull these up right now. He says he can't drop in, but 85% of, of married black men marry black women. 9% white women, 3% Hispanic women, and 3% other. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that up. Just so we can get a visual of it. So I'm going to stop this screen, and then I'm going to share what he just gave me. If I can find it. I'm looking for it. There it is right there. So there you go with the black interracial marriages, right? How many black men and women have married out? Have a white spouse. So you got black men in the blue, black women in the green, right? So 409,000 black men, 172,000 black women, right? Uh, Hispanic spouses, 162,000 black men, about 82,000 black women. And other spouses, 130,000 um, black men, about 53,000 black women. So let's look at the other graphic uh, really quickly. I don't want to have my stuff all out here, but it is what it is. Uh, black marriage. Black marriage in 2017, among non-Hispanic African-Americans age 15 and up, who black men married? 85% of black men have a black wife. 9% white spouse, 3% Hispanic spouse, 3% other. Black women, 93% have a black husband, 4% a white spouse, 2% Hispanic spouse, 1% other, okay? This is, is kind of odd to me because, I mean, when you think about it, if black women are so, uh, you know, if they're so upwardly mobile and that's one of the things that makes women desirable, then why are not they not being selected by all these other kinds of men? Why are they not desirable as mates to men from other races, given that they have all of these accolades to draw down on, okay? Shout out to uh, Joe Average brother, brother. Thank you for the uh, contribution. So having said that, I, let me just get back into this article. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I wanted to read a good chunk of it and then probably tomorrow I'll finish it up. But one of the things I think this is important uh, for is because most of you don't have access to this kind of scholarship or these kind of articles, and you can go back and just listen to it. And another thing is that it's easy to, you know, it's easier for you to digest the information this way because 
because it's in the spoken word. So, so you don't have access and it's easier to digest when you got commentary along with it and it's put within the context of what you already hear in the manuscript. So Dr. Johnson is weighed in and I saw protagonist say something also. He says, black women claim they're more race loyal than black men. It could be that others don't find them attractive. It could also be that other men have no willingness to serve in a gynocracy. Ooh wee. And look, Lady Miss Green says, thank you, brother, for the information. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining and for being a member. I appreciate your participation in the Green Gorilla channel. It's not all about lambasting and being mean and uh, evil spirited. It's, it's about, you know, letting black men let, blow off some steam and having, a, you know, a discussion about what we actually think. And I think that's, you know, profitable for women, particularly black women uh, to get. Uh, since we, it seems impossible for us sometimes to have dialogue face to face. So um, having said all that, let me get back to this article. And thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for providing uh, those visuals. OK. So getting back to it. Getting back to this article, right? How happy can these young men be? So he's talking about why there is a lack of black men available to black women in the marriageable years because they're dying, <laughs> right? And then he says, how happy can these young men be that the remaining brothers are having a field day with the ladies? However, even the remaining black men are not that well off. Almost a half a million of them are behind bars. And this trend continues. An estimated one third of black men in the inner city have a drug problem. And 25 through 50% of them are steady, uh, steadily unemployed. So it ain't like there's just all of this, you know, graviness going on over here on the black male side of the coin because there's some deep seated problems. And these problems have persisted into the 2020s. So then he goes on to say, there's a small minority of black men who are living free, unaddicted, and employed, and maybe living on easy street. However, if he's run into the same women many men have encountered lately, he has found that as a result of prior abuse by those same men, some of these black women are angry, defensive, and manipulative. It is a small consolation to have an abundance of women from which to choose when many of these women have been battered into a very negative response to all men. So Ms. Wallace is also correct when she says that the last 50 years has seen a growing distrust, even hatred between black men and women. She acknowledges that it was perpetuated by white racism, but claims that black ignorance of the sexual politics of their experience in this country played its part. Again, she has a point. What I question and why I'm troubled by her book is how she comes to the conclusion that the addicted, imprisoned, and unemployed black male is the main culprit in this scenario. I already know why she and Ms. Shange are being heralded as the main pundits of the black condition. In agreement with Pauline Stone, I acknowledge that within Afro-American culture, maleness creates certain privileges. That is, certain freedom and rights are attached to being male. However, she correctly attributes this to the societal strategy of manipulating blacks through the maintenance of sexual inequalities in the home and in workplace. In both cases, the main beneficiaries of the division that ensues are white male capitalists. Now, we've been talking about this whole concept of black male privilege. I personally don't see it. I mean, I, I don't see it very much at all. Now, this man was speaking in 79. Whatever vestiges of male privilege that may have existed back then have been eradicated. Now, because feminism has had its time to work his magic on the fabric of the culture in which we live for the past, since the, the, the 80s? What, you got 40 years? So one could argue well, what's left of any privileges that all males may have or might have. So anyway, that's kind of like where my point of departure with the author uh, sits, but still, before I digress too far, let me continue. 
He says, Ms. Shange and Ward uh, Wallace hardly mentioned this group of beneficiaries in their uh, diatribe against black men. And that's what black men are scratching their heads about. Like, in the end, like, what, what are black men really benefiting from, from the social arrangements which currently exist? It seems to me that white men, by and large, are the primary winners here. But they don't take any effort to lambast them or to issue attack, an attack against them. It's primarily black men. So anyway, obviously, they could not get on Broadway or in the pages of the New York Times with such an observation. So it becomes tactical, strategic, and as some people might even put it, it's lucrative to have the right target. It's money making. It's, you know, a way to secure the bag. Talk bad, bad mouth black men give a half rate or, you know, an incomplete analysis of the dysfunction of black men and the relationships they have with black women. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're able to make a, 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 a boatload of cash. And everybody's willing to listen to what you have to say. Because now you got your sights on the right target. Then he goes on to say, but the divisive effect of sexism is a two-way sword. And this is what was, was, was dope about Staples, right? As, as psychiatrist Alvin Poussaint notes, at the college uh, level, particularly in black colleges, black females outnumber the males and outdo them in terms of achievement. That's going to tell you something about who's going to be achieving and moving into different spots. The white male and white female feel much more threatened by the black male than by the black female, which may set up a condition for easier access. We've been saying this in the manosphere again and again and again. Black women are not threatening to white women or to black men. I mean, excuse me, white men. They pose no social threat, they pose no political threat, and they definitely don't pose a physical threat. We've been saying this incessantly, and but for some reason, black women like to imagine themselves as somehow posing the very threat that they, if they took time to reflect on it, don't impose at all. But I don't want to digress too far from this point. So he says, is this just another warmed over version of the black matriarchy theory? I think not. There's every reason to believe that by the turn of the century, black women will exceed black men in terms of occupation and income. They already have more education. As for black men, their future is revealed in the statistic that of 23 million Americans that are functional illiterates, the highest proportion is among black males. And Dr. Johnson talked about this in relation to the, uh, the level of uh, reading competency among black boys in the California uh, school system or educational system. These boys are functionally illiterate. So if you want to talk about sexism, and this is, what it, this is what's so great about him, Staples, is that he turns sexism into something that is not just something that's directed towards the female sex. It can also be manifested in ways in which black men or any other group of men for that matter could be, you know, the, the primary, not beneficiaries, but uh, what's the best way to say? The, pr the primary losers in the equation of the sexual balance. So anyway, he goes on to say, who is to blame for this situation? According to Ms. Wallace, it's the black man himself. She says, yes, forces conspire against him, but he allows others to make decisions for him. He allows life to happen to him. He trusts the white bureaucracy enough to allow them to put him behind bars, to allow them to take care of his wife and children. Finally, it is the black man who has made this undeclared choice. The black women uh, is simply along for the ride. Then he goes on. That's a hell of a statement to make for, you know, for, for a black woman to make, knowing that slavery existed, Jim Crow existed, 
black men, black women fighting together in the civil rights movement to gain some semblance of equality and opportunity. And directly after that, you get white women shoehorning themselves into minority status. Then you get all of these black men who have now moved from the South into these Midwestern, Western, and Eastern cities. And then the work begins to dry up because you have a, uh, an economy that's moving from an industrial based to a service based economy. The jobs are being outsourced and, and, and the labor market is becoming more and more mechanized. So you got a whole bunch of men who, for the most part, are not doing very well at all. And the thing that you come up with is that they're doing it to themselves. That's a hell of a statement to make. So then, this is uh, Staples' response. There it is. The ultimate extension of existentialist philosophy in the American ideology of free will. And so, so basically, I mean, you hear this over and over again. It's all about choice. So when you, you hear the term existentialism, understand that it's connected to the ideal of choice and free will. And that that's the perennial condition in which people exist, namely that they're forced, even if they you know don't don't want to, they're forced forced to make choices. Okay, so that's the general thrust of existentialism. So he says, such an existentialist philosophy demeans Miss Wallace and all those who will listen to her. Surely we need to decrease of black male sexism whenever we are able to reach an agreement on what it is. But we also need something that will unify us and make us whole again. In that regard, what does Miss Wallace have to offer? The final pages of her book find her starting off with the admonition that black women should never forget how the black man has let them down. Before some words of praise for her feminist counterpart, Miss Shange, she is critical of black women who choose to pursue an independent course but have children. Obviously, what is left out or obviously what is left is for black women to go it alone without children or man as excess baggage. I mean, excess baggage while she writes her own history. Perhaps she will find some followers for this arcane philosophy. For what it's worth, I just finished the study of middle class black singles, most of whom were women. Many of them had become de facto practitioners of the Wallace theory. They were alone, upwardly mobile, without a man or a child. The older they were, the less satisfactory was this condition. And man, black men in the manuscript talk about that all the time. You get all these women who, for some reason, are able to be shoehorned into the American success story, whereas black men are not. And these women are not happy. M most people don't wanna die alone. Who wants to die alone? Who wants to be left destitute of companionship as they reach their older years and to have no generations to come to spring forth from their loins? But, oh, okay, well. Now, one could argue that women are basically saying, okay, well, this is the hand we've been dealt. We may as well embrace it. But that's another question. Anyway, he says, the role of male or female cannot stand alone as a sense of identity. Huh. Well, it's seemingly not the case now, right? It only makes sense, satisfies the soul when it relates to some other role. To be ontological, humans are not meant to live out their lives alone with no higher purpose than self-satisfaction. I said this the other day. I said this the other day. If the only principle that you operate by is a hedonistic principle, your own self-satisfaction and your own pleasure. What are you left with? That's a miserly existence. That is an ultimately miserly existence. Then he goes on to say, ultimately the issue in America is not that of sexism or racism. It is a monopoly of capitalism and its impact on human potential. In terms of the Maoist concept of major and minor contradictions in a society, sexism and the problems black women face are derivatives of larger of a larger contradiction between capital and labor. 
sexism as is racism is beneficial to the capitalist order by maintaining differentials in privileges and rewards within the working class. Miss Wallace, unfortunately, does not place the issue of black male sexism in any kind of theoretical framework, thus losing sight of the structural context in which sexism manifests itself. Indeed, the most glaring flaw in her book is her acceptance of the status quo in the degree to which she exonerates capitalism of any responsibility for the problems between black men and women. To completely ignore capitalism's systemic features and its role in black oppression is to adopt a normative approach of neoconservative social analysis and bias no different than whites, which makes her book an example of a rightward turn in America or of the rightward turn in America. If she had placed her work in a more global rather than visceral and race nationalist perspective, we might understand why black men exhibit these symptoms of sexism. She speaks, for example, of the growing distrust and hatred between black men and women in the last 50 years. Yet she does not, in her very descriptive book, tell us why. Could it be that the urban industrial transformation from the rural peasant culture sowed the seeds for alienation of black men from their cultural moorings? In the South, black women were respected and men helped to provide for their families. As they came to the Northern or the urban North, materialistic values gained ascendancy. The symbols of manhood, sexual conquest, dominance of women, etc., became important to black men because they lacked the real symbols, political and economic power. So I'm gonna leave it here because there's something, you know, there's a lot that I agree with in what uh, Robert Staples has to say, because he's looking at systemic structures that create these kind of rifts between black men and women as opposed to just interpersonal behavior or individual behavior and virtue or vice. But having said all that, um, I want to invite some people in to see if they want to uh, say something about what I've read thus far. I don't want to go too far off into this. And thank you, my brother Goshen. I see you uh, kicked in with a donation. I appreciate that. And also Mark Swift, thank you so much for your uh, kind donation. Every donation helps. So what I'd like to do is uh, leave open the line for anyone to come in and offer their own analysis or to offer their own uh, understanding or interpretation of what I've read thus far. And if, you know, I give it a minute or so to transpire and if nobody chimes in, I'm going to cut it short and then I'll read the rest of this tomorrow. But I think that, you know, the article demonstrates more than anything else that at least black men in academia were questioning some of the main themes, the general thrust of the black feminist positioning. But nowadays, you'd be hard pressed to find few scholars beyond that of Tommy Curry, Dr. Ronald Neal. Dr. Tia San Johnson, and a few others. I mean, I'm not saying that there are not others who are doing this work, but there's not that many people. And right now, it's become so difficult to say anything outside of the context of the current norm related to the feminist positioning that if you do say something in contradiction to it, you get immediately typecast as a racist. Well, not a racist, but you get typecast as in a, a, a misogynoir chauvinist pig. And of course, we can do better than that. We can have a more fine grain and a more, uh, you know, fine tuned analysis than to just resort to, uh, you know, the name calling and the ascription of negative characteristics and qualities to men. We got to be able to do better than that. So I've left the lines open. Again, I'll leave them open. Nobody chimes in another 30 seconds or so. I'm out of here, man. It's Saturday. I'm a little bit tired as it is. But I will, I promise you tomorrow, I'll come up and read the rest of this, this text. Okay? 
So I'm going to give it 10 more seconds. If nobody chimes in, I'm Audi 5000, G. Well, thank you for joining me. I'm out of here, y'all. And I'll, I'll be here tomorrow, and I'll read the rest of this article. So have an enjoyable Saturday night. Until the next time. Oh, and I also want to give a shout out to Rashid Barnes for the donation. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it greatly. So y'all be good, man. I'll see y'all tomorrow around the same time, and I'll read the rest of this article. Peace. I know you play a haters gon' hate Cause I'm at the finish line and I'm in the first place I'm a winner and I know I'm never lose Cause I'm way too ahead of you do I know you play a haters gon' hate Cause I'm at the finish line and I'm in the first place The waste from my first place Put the pedal to the metal Let it burn Then I blow up in your face For the boom of the big bass Turn around nigga Fuck face Nigga turn off the track Leave your hook with a burnt face Fuck a nigga cause he gon' hate Put some pippin' in his cup Set him up for the date rate I go I blaze Drug red nades in a party Tell him clearing out the whole place Who got that rock money loan You can hear it in my tone That I home you don't know me Better run better run Nigga bustle like a gun Ain't a motherfucker nigga That can hold me I'm tired of nigga Suck and find your bitch So she can blow me Ain't nobody never take Like a young boy Many bomb boys And he hit like a donkey And he rode with a convoy With them hot toys If you really wanna get it Get it jumping. I blow that monkey That hairy bad green gorilla Take it through the nose Put it on my mind I'm a beast like Michael Jackson Thriller Your boys are tripping I ain't hearing Tell you're speaking something Don't do too much Because your pussies Always do it for me Yeah get it good Get it like I should All the hate motherfuckers Better keep it coming Put them all in a bar Throw a bomb in that motherfucker Leave their body slumping I know you play a haters Go hate Cause I'm at the finish line And I'm in the first place I'm a winner